Vielen Dank. Thank you so much, dear Anne Charlotte. <laughs> it is so nice to be here, to be back to Sweden, where I come quite often, because I have had much support from Sweden over the years, and even the woman who first uh, helped me, Anna Runenburg, where is she? Uh, there she is. <laughs> this is actually one of the reasons why we were funded by CETA and are still funded by CETA. But also, I want to thank the Toast on Sweden group that has been so supportive over these last years, and, uh, and Charlotte particularly, for all the support and help she's given me over the years, volunteering first at Tostan, uh, and now starting Tostan Sweden, and leading a very active group here um, that really has brought much attention to Tostan and much support from uh, many people and uh, foundations in Sweden. I thought about the talk I would give today, um, and some of you have already s heard some uh, information on Tostan before because I've been here several times. So I thought I would start by taking you back to Senegal. Uh, on a recent trip that I did to eastern Senegal near the border of Mali, uh, very far away actually because of the roads that you take to get there, in fact, it's about nine hours to even get to Guderi, the, the town you see there. But then, once you get to Guderi, to go to the villages where Tostan works, it's at least an hour or two hours into um, the bush on very uh, bumpy roads. Um, I had not been to this project. We had started two years ago, actually, because it, it really was far away. And I am at Tostan International now. So we do have a Tostan Senegal office in Chess, Senegal. Tostan International, however, is based in Dakar, Senegal. And so I tried as much as possible to pull out of Tostan Senegal to allow the Senegalese staff to, to take over. I used to go all the time out to visit everywhere. I attended all the public declarations to end female genital cutting and child marriage. But I really wanted to go to, to visit Gudiri because I had heard so many wonderful things and about what was going on there. And I was so happy I went, and I'm very happy to share a bit of what I saw there. I went to Guta, and this is the sign I saw about five miles outside of the village. <laughs> and, and I knew when I saw this sign <laughs> that I would be in for a big treat. Uh, Tostan Guta Village Défenseur des Droits Humains. I thought, wow, <laughs> I will see uh, how this village is defending human rights. And I wasn't at all disappointed. Um, when I arrived, I was welcomed, of course, uh, as we always are in Tostan communities, by singing and dancing. Um, as many of you know, it is part of our program to encourage local traditions, of the, the very positive local t traditions of all the communities where we work, the music, the dance, the songs. And so um, they know that I love this also and join in usually with, with the dancing and singing. But I also saw lots and lots of signs. <laughs> and I realized that something special was going on. And they had not told me that 30 communities had decided to abandon female genital cutting and child marriage, and as well, all forms of gender-based violence against girls and women. And this was the day they had chosen when they heard I was coming to celebrate their, their joint and collective declaration. So I found 16 communities, representatives from 16 that had participated in our program for a two-year period. And I also found 14 communities that were represented who had been adopted by those participating communities waiting for me with a sign uh, from each of the communities and the representatives from those communities. Um, as you can see, the young girls were very involved in this decision. Uh, they had been out on a caravan. This is what the t-shirts say. Indimagu is the name of the program. It means dignity in Pular. And the, they had been very active uh, in the decision to abandon these practices. 
Uh, and as you see, all forms of gender violence, um, the gender-based violence. Uh, so it was a very uh, extraordinary welcome that I received when I realized that they were going to abandon these practices on this day. Um, this is the village chief. He started the ceremony by explaining how proud and happy he is that they are abandoning practices that harm girls and women. He explained that many people did not understand the harmful consequences of female genital cutting. They never had ever talked about it even before. It was a taboo subject. But today, he said, people know, they understand, and they also know about human rights. And he said, many people think that men in Senegal or in our communities uh, are against women, but we're not. We just didn't know. And this is something that men all over Senegal have said to me. We just didn't know. No one ever talked about this subject before because it was so taboo. We were told that to even talk about it could lead to being paralyzed or going crazy or death. And this was a, suspicion, a superstition that people had around talking about this practice. So he said that the men supported this, the religious leaders all were there supporting this, the children and, of course, the women. And the cutters were there also um, to end this, this practice. Um, then uh, Dala Tunkara. She's only 26. I was so surprised. It was the first time in all my visits anywhere in Senegal where I had found the coordinator of the community management committee that Tostan establishes in the communities where, where we implement our program, it was the first time I found a woman 26 years old who had been elected to lead the community management committee, which has 17 members uh, and is leading men. Uh, now, usually you have women, older women usually, who are head of uh, the women's groups, but very rarely women who are leading mixed groups of men and women. She's 26. She had never been to school. She went through the Tostan program, and she was elected to be the coordinator. And when she spoke, I understood why. She's very dynamic. And she had a whole list of projects and activities that the Community Management Committee had undertaken, had achieved already. Uh, and it was very exciting to listen to her talk. Another woman spoke, and this was probably the most exciting part for me, because it was new for me. This woman talked to me about, and talked to the, to, to, to the whole uh, audience that came to, to celebrate the end of female genital cutting, that not only had they abandoned harmful traditional practices, but because of their education on human rights and responsibilities, because of their new knowledge on democratic ways to organize and how important it is for women and girls to participate uh, in the decisions of the community on that local level, but even on a higher level, she said that she had decided to run for office. And she explained to me that in the July elections of 2014, there were 63 uh, Tostan participants uh, who were elected to the rural council. And of those, there were 41 women. And I, I hadn't been told this. And I, was, I called the coordinator immediately, and I said, why didn't you tell me this? And he says, well, we're not supposed to be political. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, this is not really about politics. This is really about people at the grassroots level, and particularly women, who had never publicly, again, you know, women, of course, uh, influenced the men. They always say, they call it pillow talk. Uh, they, they may have influenced the men uh, at night in, in the uh, cause at, before going to bed, but this is public. This is women speaking out publicly and discussing issues that they had really never been included in, involved in before, engaged in. And when I asked her, I said, um, what led you to wanting to be elected? She said, I learned that everyone has the right to vote and to be elected. And she said, I decided I now have a platform based on human rights. I'm going to advocate for health, for education, for women's work, 
And she said, I have something to say, and I'm going to say it. Um, I asked another woman who had told me she, she, she had been elected also. Um, and I said to her, are there other women on the council? And she said, oh, yes, there are other women who were elected, but they never say a word. And I said, she said, well, we at Toast Time have learned. Uh, again, a lot of our program is about rehearsal and about uh, uh, preparing to, to, um, to speak publicly and have confidence in speaking publicly. And this also was a very moving moment for me. Uh, this woman whom I encircled in blue, uh, you notice she's wearing Swedish colors, right? <laughs> I thought of you all. I said, oh, sweet, our Swedish supporters should be here. <laughs> because they all had on yellow and blue. I said, oh, this is Sweden all the way. <laughs> um, but it, that was her group from her community that was dressed like this. And she was the, she, she was the facilitator for the, the class and next to the supervisor who's in purple. And the girl, Mariama, was, uh, I was talking to her and she, I said, where are you from? Are you from this village? She said, no, I'm from Malam Nyaning. And I said, Malam Nyaning? I said, well, we had a declaration there in 2004. And she said, yes, I was there. She said, I was just a little girl. And I said, well, Anne Charlotte and I had interviewed uh, a man named Bubu Sal, whose daughter had died because of female genital cutting. And in fact, she had um, been cut. And then she got a fever two weeks later. And Bubu Sal, his name was, it was his, her, her father, thought that she had malaria. And he treated her for malaria. And then he saw she wasn't getting better. And so he finally took her to a health hut, which was far away. He had to go uh, walk. That's why he didn't go initially. He thought he could just treat her for malaria. And when he got there, the doctor said, no, she has tetanus. And she, it is too late. It is too late to save her. And she died. Her name was Hadi. And um, he said, it was not until I went through the Tostan program and I learned about germ transmission that I learned that my daughter did not die of, she did not die of tetanus. In fact, she died of female genital cutting. She was infected when she was cut. And this is what led to her getting tetanus. And this is his granddaughter. She said, Bubu Sal's my grandfather. And it was a very moving moment for me, oh, to think that his granddaughter was now a facilitator at Tostan and that she had been leading the class in ending female genital cutting in their community and uh, was very proud of it. And this man is Mali. And I said, oh, you have my name, Mali. <laughs> and he, he's an imam, a religious leader. And when I met him, he told me, Oh, I'm so proud because he said, I have been leading the movement um, to prevent fistula in this area. He said, uh, myself and a woman named Jaina Badimbali, he, and he pulled me outside and he said, you know, look, see that motorcycle? We've been to 40 communities telling people about fistula. Do you all know what fistula is? Um, I just briefly. Uh, fistula is a condition that is prevalent in the developing world, in many cases in Senegal and other African countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's when, uh, when a, usually child marriage, when a girl is too young and her pelvic bones are not yet well developed, when the baby's head it comes, comes out, uh, it's when the head gets stuck uh, because the girl is too underdeveloped. And when that happens, the head is, stays bone against bone, the head against the pelvic bone. And if it stays for about 24 hours, it creates um, uh, a, a hole because the, the, the soft tissue, the blood supply is cut off. So about six days after, the, the, of course, the baby dies and the head compresses and, and, and is, comes out. But the, the, um, the, the, the dead tissue then sloughs off, and it leaves a hole between the rectum and the uh, vagina or between the bladder and the vagina. And so she's incontinent, and you can imagine uh, what this creates for her. 
if she has, is not healed. The, the, the very sad thing is, is that people have beliefs around fistula. They believe that if a woman develops fistula, it's because she was adul adulterous. She, and, and so she is not only victimized by having this horrible condition, but she, she, is, she has to go live in her own hut. She's isolated, uh, marginalized. I think it's one of the most important projects that Tostan has been involved in recently. We have helped to identify uh, many women who had fistula and have led them to our partner organization, AMREF, who now operates on these women. They have camps. And it's very hard to get them to come to these camps. So this is why AMREF and the doctors in Senegal came to Tostan and said, please help us to, um, to get these women to understand that what fistula is, that it's not their fault. That, and a part of the problem was also is these women did not want to come to the operation camps because they were embarrassed, because they were, uh, they, they, were, they were incontinent and couldn't take a taxi. So by just providing diapers for them to wear, it helped them holding their hands to come to the operations and reassuring them they'd never been in a, a hospital, let alone had an operation. They were very scared. So Malin was very, Malé was very excited because he had identified two women, he said, who had the operation, and he said, they're back in their villages now and they're healed. And when we did our work in 40 villages, he said, we let people know this was not at all the case that these women were adulterous, um, this was not their fault, and we especially, he said, we will prevent fistula in the future because we are ending child marriage. And it was just uh, very exciting <laughs> to, um, to know that he had done this work. He was an imam, very respected, and that he had decided to, to become very engaged in, in this cause. Um, and this was a picture that I love because it shows the different generations, the grandmother and the granddaughter. Um, it is what we call generational change in three years. Our program lasts three years. But in one generation, it has led to a huge change in the life of this little girl. She will not be married at 12. She will be able to go to school. She will not undergo female genital cutting. Uh, and she looks up to her, her, her sisters and her aunts and her mother and sees that they are leading groups. They are being elected uh, to to the local council and are making important decisions and are holding meetings. And uh, I, I just realized how this generation will lead to a whole new society in uh, Senegal that will be uh, more equal and will allow for girls and women to find their true place in society. So you may ask how this happened. So briefly, for those of you who don't know, uh, Tostan's three-year community empowerment program uh, consists of modules, uh, which I will discuss briefly. And we have two classes, one for adults and one for adolescents. Originally, we just did this for adults. And then we found that the adolescents really were not going to school or they were dropping out of school. And they really needed this human rights education also and the health education. These were young people who were getting married without knowing anything about reproductive health. And they, they, we realized that this was just as important for them and that we couldn't do it just for the adolescents without doing it for the adults because they were learning human rights. And they would come home. We did try this at one point, and it did not work. The children were coming home telling their parents about human rights, and the parents were going, what are you talking about? What about our rights? <laughs> And so we, we, we now do human rights only. We don't just do women's rights. We don't just do children's rights. We do human rights and include everyone so that everyone becomes engaged and uh, knows their responsibility towards one another. We also do training for the community management committees. Uh, they establish a community a management committee in their, in their villages. And these CMCs, as we call them, uh, you saw the coordinator of one of them. They federate all the different activities of the community so that people are working in synergy. Uh, before, there would be just a health committee or there would be an environmental committee 
or there would be the parents of the school children's committee. Um, and they were not working together, really, when they could have been working together and uh, making things run more effectively and efficiently. So by federating all the activities of the community and with the CMC, we, <clears throat> we found that it helped um, a lot in, in changing the, um, the effectiveness of, of the community and, and uh, achieving the goals that they had set. And this is very important at Tostan for the communities themselves to identify what their goals are for the future, rather than our going in and saying, look, we have an agenda. This is what we want you to do, which unfortunately is what uh, quite a few development organizations have done in the past. Um, rather saying to them, you need to identify what you would like for the future of your community. Uh, and then we present human rights <clears throat> education as a way of helping people come together around, around what their guiding principles are for achieving their goals. In other words, uh, if one of their goals is economic prosperity, uh, are we going to, to allow our girls to go off and work as maids in the nearby city uh, to achieve that economic uh, prosperity? And with human rights education, people decided, no, this is not an option. Because children have the right to education. Children have the right to live with their families. Uh, and we have a responsibility not to exploit children. And therefore, these are our, our, our guiding principles. We will look for, uh, we will seek economic growth, but not by exploiting our children. So this was a very important part of the program. And it lasts three to four months, this part on human rights and reflecting, thinking through uh, some of the practices that were common in the communities, and then comparing them with uh, some of the principles they had decided were good principles for, for guiding them along their road to, to um, achieving their goals. And always, as you see, I say, I think one of the important parts of our program also was establishing what the deeper values of the community were. And they would say health, peace, unity, keeping the family together, uh, respect for one another. All these things were values they did not want to lose as they worked towards achieving their goals. So uh, we gave them also information uh, about the decisions they were making, like health, uh, teaching them systems of the body. Uh, you will see when we, when we discuss that a bit and then the skills they need to achieve their goals. So the first year of the program is called the COBE. Uh, it, is, it includes the democracy, human rights and responsibilities, problem solving, hygiene, and health. Um, these are two of the pictures from the, the, the human rights uh, flip chart that we use to to introduce human rights. For example, can you guess what, uh, you can guess what the one on the right is, or it's to your left? No, it's to my left, it's to your right. You can guess what that human right is. Um, the right to, oh, you can't guess? <laughs> ah, <laughs> that's the right to health, and then the, but you probably can't guess what this one is on the, on the other side. The right to peace and security. Uh, we always put use uh, positive pictures in all the work we do at Tostan. Uh, we would never put, for example, the right to be free from all forms of violence. We would never put you know, someone hitting someone else. We would always put dialogue and people discussing and coming uh, to solutions to conflict by dialogue rather than uh, anything negative. And we use these drawings to start the discussion within the classroom and getting people to talk about uh, what does this right mean and uh, have you ever been a victim of violence and how did it make you feel? Uh, we, the right to be free from all forms of discrimination. Have you, ever been a, uh, have you ever been discriminated against? How did it feel or have you discriminated against someone and why did you do that? Um, and people get very emotional actually in these classes as they talk about these things. They never discussed them before and they start realizing this really 
is not good to discriminate and how can we together work to stop this discrimination or how to stop this violence and this really uh, leads throughout these this first year to quite amazing decisions made by the classroom and then the entire community i'll explain how that works in just a minute but um, just to uh, give you an idea of what the, the people's reaction to human rights i I think some of you have seen this video, but I, I've seen it maybe 200 times, <laughs> and I still love it. Um, I just wanted you to hear the, the villagers' voice. It's only, uh, it's only two or three minutes, uh, but I think it really speaks to the importance that human rights education had at the village level in Senegal and other countries. This is the Gambia, where actually where Bjorn served as a volunteer. <laughs> um, so I can, whoops, I hope. Second, I would like everybody 
and man to live in a very good environment whereby they will all get their good health. In the next two years, everybody will be able to know how to run their own projects if they get it, how to solve their problems if they have their own projects and know how to run everything that they get. <laughs> uh, the woman who did this uh, film is, was a volunteer at Tustan, and um, she, it was an amateur film. She had 30 minutes because there was no electricity in the, in, 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 in the village, and so she rushed in and <laughs> asked everybody about human rights, but it's one that we've used everywhere and that people uh, really enjoy because it's the voice of the villagers themselves. Um, as one woman said, it, it makes our lives easier. Uh, you know, that's hard to measure. That's one of the problems we have, is how to measure empowerment, how to measure those intangible things, but that are so critical to the lives of the people that you work with. In the second part of the program, it's uh, called the Aude, which is a pular, Fulani word that means uh, planting the seed. Then people learn literacy, math, microcredit skills, and management skills. And they actually do small project implementation with support of the uh, facilitator and the supervisor who regularly comes and supports the, the work of the villagers, the participants, and the community management committee. We also started a very innovative project four years ago, teaching literacy through SMS texting. And that has led, uh, as you can see in that picture, to much more enthusiasm about learning to read and write. Because uh, it was pretty hard. There were, first of all, there aren't that many books in national languages. Um, but also, when women came in tired from working in the fields, they really didn't want to go off and read a book by themselves. But being able to communicate with their friends, with their husbands who live in Dakar or in Sweden, <laughs> suddenly being able to write SMS messaging uh, text was just very, very uh, appealing to them, and they worked very hard to uh, learn to read and write. And the literacy rates went way up. We had an evaluation on this, and it was amazing how the, the literacy rates went up. Um, they also used this for health, for finding out if the, the, the health workers were there when they needed to walk long distances. It helped them in so many ways, pricing vegetables at the market or even uh, when there were bushfires or um, other problems, they would alert other communities about uh, things that were going on. So this, this, this turned out to be a very important part of our program. We have continued with our program by adding other modules to the three-year program. Right now, in a project funded by CETA, uh, we are doing a peace and security module. And in that module, we are particularly emphasizing the important role of women in conflict resolution. We noted that many of the negotiators and mediators uh, on local and regional level were always men. And so we worked to train the women to become very active in conflict resolution at all levels. And this, this program has led to amazing, an amazing number of conflicts uh, resolved at a local level. Um, and as you know, this is a critical time in West Africa where there are all kinds of um, influences from, as you, I'm sure you've heard about Mali and the fundamentalists and the problems that are existing and how 
we believe that this type of education will really help to prevent conflict going to a much higher level. And uh, if they can resolve these conflicts at this local level, uh, it's going to be really important, particularly in the future, for prevention. We also have a new module on reinforcing parental practices. Uh, one of the things that we learned uh, in doing participatory research with uh, our, our, our participants was that uh, women knew almost nothing about ways to s help prepare their children for going to school. Uh, as you know, that in the villages where we're working, where there are very few resources, often uh, life is a question of survival. And children were prepared to go work in fields, and the girls were taught to work in the household and uh, manage their families. But they were quite unprepared when the government suddenly said, now you have to send your, your children to school, and now you have to send your girls to school. And these children were going to school never having heard a word of French, never having seen a book. Uh, and also, we found many social norms in place, for example, it was not allowed to talk to your baby because people believed that evil spirits could harm their children or would be jealous and might take their babies away from them. And uh, I know the woman who's our coordinator of our project, Penda, she said to me, Molly, when I had my first baby, I would come home and I would talk to her and look her in the eye. And my mother came over and said, stop, stop. This is very dangerous. Don't do this. And I said, oh, Penda, <laughs> no, what did you do? And she said, I stopped talking to my baby. I, I didn't know. And this was the, uh, when we started teaching what you can do to uh, prepare your child, how you can actually uh, promote brain development. Uh, we actually taught brain development, how the brain develops. Literally, we had women crying and saying, we did it all wrong. We just didn't know. And so this has become a very important module also as women learn to talk to their babies. And also, we, we provided lots of children's books in national languages. We started in three, and we're hoping now to extend this program um, across the six countries where we're working. And it is, it is really amazing how people were doing almost exactly what you should not do <laughs> if you want to promote brain development. But they were seeing it as their form of child protection. This is the thing. They were doing it out of love for their children to protect their children. Um, so this has become a very important project that we've done in 340 communities, and uh, we hope to continue. Our methodology is using song, dance, theater, poetry, things that people love and are already doing well. So classes are lots of fun. It involves games, too, and play. And um, so when women come in from the field, they uh, can feel relaxed. And uh, they can feel that uh, they don't have to sit in a, in a very uh, severe type of classroom with a teacher who tells them what to do and gives them lessons and imposes ideas. So it is really about discussing. And somebody said to me, oh, this is like group therapy. <laughs> they really discuss how they can make difference, a difference in their lives and, and make their lives easier. We use the oral tradition of promoting the community conversation and, di and dialogue and deliberation about uh, things they want to change in their community. And our strategy uh, came from a village imam, Demba Jaura. Uh, he, he was one of the first to to react when a community stood up and abandoned female genital cutting. And at first, he was shocked and upset. But after he learned himself what the dangers were and what was involved, he became very engaged. But he told me, Molly, the way you're going about this is all wrong. He said, you, ha you have one village that stood up alone and decided to abandon this practice. This was in 1997. He says, this will never work. He says, you just don't understand Africa if, if you're going to continue to do like this. And I said, OK, well, what should we be doing? And he said, you know, this is not how Africans make decisions. Africans do make decisions with the whole social network, everyone who matters. And we don't all live in one village. We live in many villages. 
He said, all of my important relatives are in 10 communities. And I said, oh my goodness, what's the answer? And he said, well, I will put on my shoes and I will walk to all those communities and I will explain to them why this practice is harmful and that we, we just didn't know and that perhaps it's time to change. He always says, Molly, life has got legs and is walking and we need to be walking with, with, with life or we will be left behind. So it's time to change this practice. <laughs> but he, he is really behind a, a movement uh, that has led to these 7,000 communities that Anne Charlotte mentioned abandoning uh, female genital cutting um, and is recognized uh, by all of the UN organizations as being the approach to ending this practice. We call it organized diffusion. And that starts in the classroom with an empowering education, uh, the democracy and human rights, understanding our rights and responsibilities, getting the new information on health, and then dialoguing and coming to consensus among participants. The, then each participant also adopts a learner, and each session is discussed with an, another person in the community, which they adopt during the program. And then they hold sessions for the village to make them aware also, raise awareness on what they've learned and the, some of the decisions they would like to make, but with the participation of the whole community and the engagement of everyone. They also hold inter-village meetings. We, Tostan helps them to organize them by giving transportation money so people can attend and discuss together um, some of the decisions that people are making. And then these famous declarations. Um, Somebody said to me, oh, aren't, isn't that just a publicity stunt? And I said, you know, this is much more than uh, publicity. It's about changing from one way of doing things uh, among a group of people who have for centuries done this and saying, don't worry, as of tomorrow, everyone will start doing that. And it's for, uh, for, for, for health and for human rights. It's for promoting peace and well-being in the community. And because of that, then people can abandon safely. They know that their daughters will not be excluded tomorrow because, of course, people were heavily sanctioned if they didn't cut their daughters. But through the public declaration, they understand that nobody will be marginalized and no one will be ostracized because everyone has decided to do it together. And these declarations are on the radio, they're on television, and people are celebrated for, for promoting health and, and human rights. Um, and even if you look at the first village I showed you, I said to them, you've only been in the program two years and you've decided to end FGC. Uh, in a lot of villages, it took three years or four years, sometimes even five years, and they said, well, all our relatives have already abandoned. You know, we see them on TV and we said, oh, they're abandoning. So we thought, well, it's time for us to abandon too. But we just had never, everyone had been afraid to discuss this before Tostan came. You were afraid to bring it up because, you know, it, it, it was just very difficult. You don't understand. And so they abandoned much earlier than the other communities, but it's also because they had seen this, they had heard about it, it was on the radio, it was in their language and they knew this was happening. We believe that you know, there really is a tipping point and that soon uh, people in Senegal will all abandon. So it's scaling through networks. It starts with the, the classroom, with an individual who reaches out uh, within her community and to everyone in that community and neighboring communities and even far away to relatives who may be in other parts of the country and even uh, across borders. Uh, I showed you we were on the border of Mali and Guderi, but they have reached out to their relatives because the relatives, the families, the extended families do not have uh, borders. Those are all artificial borders that the colonizers uh, traced. And so we have many of the, the Malians and Mauritanians coming together for uh, collective abandonment with the rest of their social network, their, fa their extended family. The results of the program are in five major areas. Uh, education, health, environment, and economic growth. And I put governance at the bottom because I think it's really the foundation. None of the activities will be sustained if there is not good management. 
and with the CMCs that become legally registered organization, they become NGOs, really the CBOs, um, with women elected to leadership positions, transparency, all the books are open for everyone, uh, they're registering for voting, and what was very exciting is to see so many communities paying their taxes for the first time because they understood what their taxes were for, but so now they're lobbying for services because they say, look, we paid our taxes here, so now we deserve to have health services, and they're actually using this to leverage getting the services from the government. So just briefly, so the, the, the dynamic community management committees, the community health services improved, schools built. Now, this is not your sweet, normal Swedish school, I know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of this school because the, the people of this community uh, wanted to send their girls to school. And the girls had to wait, walk 14 kilometers to the next village. So the women and the parents tried to find a place for them to stay. And they found that the girls were being used pretty much like slaves to do all the housework at night. They couldn't study. They were failing in school. And then um, two girls got pregnant. And they said, this is it. And they said, what can we do? We don't have resources to build a school. And they, they asked the government. They said, oh, no, that's way too expensive. So they got nine villages together that needed a, a middle school. And uh, together. They told the government, we're going to build the school ourselves. It's a millet stock school. <laughs> but uh, there are five classrooms like that. And they told the government, you have to provide us with teachers, which they did. They sent five teachers. So then they went around to all of the nine villages. And they said, we want just $2 from each of you. And then when people started seeing that everybody was contributing, and then somebody brought iron and cement, they said, OK. We're going to build now uh, the, the, the school. And they built three classrooms themselves. This, was, this is an old picture. Since that time, when I went back last time, they said, we built three classrooms. And then they said, and best of all, we have two women now. This was in another area of Senegal. They said, we have two women on the rural council. And we went to the, 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 the rural council and said, our community has paid all our taxes. You need to give us the roof on the, on the three cement buildings. And we got it. <laughs> so they are now, they have three classrooms in cement. They said, we still have two or three to go. And there are 132 uh, students in these schools. Uh, I did, when I visited here, I actually saw a snake. I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> mm. um, so <laughs> we, but you know, hopefully this will, but they're doing it themselves, which is what is so exciting. Uh, we also have solar units installed. We work with the Barefoot College. We're starting a training center for West Africa for women uh, so that they can do more solar uh, installation. Uh, again, I found out after I went back and said, nobody told me about these participants becoming uh, elected and rural council members. And they said, we have hundreds. And so I got a list of hundreds of participants who have now become uh, local council members and who are uh, making an impact with their human rights platforms. We have many microcredit activities, income generating activities, such as garden projects for better nutrition and income generation. Participants are doing feasibility study and, uh, before beginning their projects, and therefore they're more successful. And they're still reaching out. We have, these are a group of social mobilization agents, they're called raising awareness about female genital cutting and child marriage. These, these, this team has actually been to more than 200 communities, all of which decided to abandon the practice. And I'm very proud to say that uh, recently, UNICEF and UNFPA held a press conference with the government of Senegal. And they found uh, in the analysis of the daughter data, I mean, we will not know until maybe 2020 in the demographic and health surveys uh, how many women have actually abandoned because they only interview women from 15 to 49. But how many mothers who had had FGC had cut at least one of their daughters was 20% in 2005. But in 2010, it had gone down to 6.2%. 
So that is a reduction of 69% for girls who, um, for mothers who had cut at least one of their daughters. So um, everyone was extremely excited by this, this, this uh, government of Senegal analysis. And in ending, uh, just wanted to say, to take away three major ideas around why we believe they're, we're having uh, this success. And that is, number one, it is a holistic basic education program which acts like a foundation uh, in, and it's in national languages and it uses this human rights approach which has been really critical uh, since we began in 1996 with the human rights education. The outreach strategy, which allows people to go and meet with their relatives, the, the people who matter to them, and bring them on board so that the decisions are consensual and collective, has been critical for sustainability. And the program is inclusive. Uh, it is not just women. It is women, men, and children, creating a society where people are equal, and it's also non-judgmental. Um, in other words, we don't go in and tell people what to do and say, you're wrong, you're bad. It's simply, uh, here's the information. These are, let's come to agreement about the human rights. And you are smart, you are intelligent, and you love your children. Uh, you, are, you will make the right decision. And uh, they generally do. And in most of the cases, uh, in, in, in all of the communities where we have worked so far, people have generally decided to abandon uh, um, together and of their own accord. Just briefly, just wanted to talk briefly about, the, uh, the, about agency. Uh, in our theory of change, we're talking a lot about uh, empowerment, about bringing well-being into communities. And that well-being is defined by the communities themselves. And in order to bring about that well-being, uh, we have seen that agency is so critical. Uh, it's what, just briefly, because we are running out of time, but it's the agency of the power within. Uh, the, the women need to have confidence, know their rights, the right to speak out and voice their opinions. Um, it is also the agency is the power to do, to change things, to, to, to make a difference. Uh, and a, then the power to remake the rules. And that is what they have done in changing harmful social norms and to influence extra community structures as well uh, on the local and regional and even national level. And from that has come the empowerment and the realization of human rights for all. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you and particularly Tostan Sweden uh, CEDA, UNICEF Sweden has supported us in the Gambia, Postcode Lottery Foundation, Radio Sweden, Malin and Leonard Phil Philipson Foundation, the Berth van Kantzau <laughs> Foundation, Tom Group, and uh, many other individuals who over the years have been behind us when times were very difficult. And that has been really uh, important to all of us at Tosa. I want to thank you all.